Okay. Well, um, thanks everybody for, for coming. Hopefully we'll get some more people on Zoom uh, soon. Um, this is a, a special event for the Women's Network. We've got uh, Harriet uh, Wistrich, I'll hand over to you soon. Harriet um, uh, is with the Centre for Women's Justice, um, which is a charity. And uh, if you go to their website, you can um, uh, donate and hopefully after you've heard the work of the um, her speak about the work that she's been doing in the um, field of um, uh, fighting for, for justice for women that you'll um, do what I did this morning and uh, make a donation and if you can because it's a charity you can have the gift aid on so it makes it all the more um, valuable but I don't want to steal anything from Harriet so Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, just just a background from me. Um, I am a solicitor um, by training, and I have worked for many years in a legal aid firm called Bloomberg Pierce, that many of you may have heard of. And uh, in uh, around 2016, I uh, decided to form the Centre for Women's Justice which is um, a charity aimed at uh, holding the state accountable for uh, violence against women and challenging discrimination in the criminal justice system. So those are our kind of overarching aims, if you like. Um, and we um, are, are basically are, are about challenging um, failures in the criminal justice system and uh, helping to increase access to justice for, for women who are caught up in one way or other through the criminal justice system, whether as, as victims or as defendants, uh, or in some other way. Um, so that, that's just a little bit of, a, a, of an overview um, of what the Centre for Justice is about. And um, I, I know Val has asked me to talk a, a bit about the, the War Boys case, which um, uh, many of you, just, does anyone here know the War Boys case? So, so I don't have to, to explain too much about it, but it's, um, it's a case that actually um, I started off doing at Bernberg Pierce Solicitors uh, um, back in 2010, I think, uh, when I first got approached by one and then two of his victims who um, by that stage, he had been uh, eventually caught and sentenced, uh, tried and convicted and, and sentenced to imprisonment. Um, and the two women who approached me um, were particularly concerned about how they'd been treated by the police and felt very strongly that they wanted to hold the police accountable for the terrible failures um, that had happened in that case. And um, at that stage, um, the um, in law, um, you can't actually sue the police for negligence. So most most other um, organisations, and um, you can you know from healthcare to education mm -hmm. to to virtually every other area, you can you can sue in negligence. But the police, the, there have been a series of cases which have have tested that the most famous one being the case involving the the Yorkshire Ripper uh, Hill against Chief Constable of um, West Yorkshire, which which established and has the law stage that the police should have immunity in in, in negligence. Um, so how how did we uh, uh, approach this case? Well, um, we used the Human Rights Act. And um, the Human Rights Act, um, which had only come into law 10 years earlier, there had been a few people who had been exploring ways to, to use the Human Rights Act um, to, to extend legal rights of um, victims and others in different ways. And um, what we argued, um, so, so just, just well, what, what we argued was that, that under um, Article 3, of the, human, uh, of the European Convention of Human Rights. Um, there is a, a duty on the state to um, not commit or 
uh, allowed to, to be committed acts of torture or inhumane and degrading treatment. And uh, the duty um, obviously um, applies to the state, so the state obviously mustn't torture people or put them in inhumane places of detention or whatever, but it but it must but 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 it must but that duty extends also to ensuring um, that other institutions don't do that to people. Uh, but it, but but what we argued in, in eventually in the case which was known as DSD and MBV after the two two women um, who um, were my clients uh, was that um, the um, the duty uh, also extended to having not only a system of laws to prevent citizens from being subject to um, yeah, torture and inhumane and degrading treatment, but also to prevent uh, third parties from committing those acts. So, uh, translating that into uh, English, if you like, uh, rape, uh, the courts had already held that rape is a form of inhumane degrading treatment, and therefore um, the state has a duty, obviously, to not only to have laws in place that prevent uh, rape, but also that it actually enforces those laws. So going back to the, the actual case itself, um, as you probably know, I think you're all familiar with the case, um, uh, John Woolboys was a taxi driver who used to target uh, women, uh, usually women coming out of nightclubs late at night, uh, and he was the, the kind of classic, kind of happy, chatty, uh, you know, London cabbie who, who had the gift of the gab and used to sort of be very friendly to these women who got in the cab often, you know, he was, he was hoping they were already a bit drunk. And, and he had this little story that he used, which was, um, you know, I've got um, I've just won um, the lottery or I've, I've, I've just, I, 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 I won some money at the casino and uh, I've got all this cash here and, uh, you know, I'd love it if you had a celebratory drink with me. And uh, he, he used to offer his women in the cab to just, just have a, go on, have a little sip. Now, a lot of, a lot, I mean, you, you, you might think, well, why on earth would you do that? Would you be suspicious? But it was amazing how many women, um, uh, you know, kind of, Ended up often because they want, you know, they felt a bit embarrassed, but they, they thought, well, they're going to be polite and just share a drink with them. Um, and so, so the women drank this this drink, and he laced it with all sorts of uh, drugs, so that he um, rendered them unconscious, and then you know, raped or sexually assaulted them, and then dropped them off home again. Um, so uh, over uh, the and we know there were well, well over 100 women um, who were his victims and probably many more. Uh, and uh, we we know that for a period of six, of 10 years, um, 10 women uh, reported uh, what had happened to the police. Now, of course, if you're uh, and uh, raised, you may not remember what. What happened to you? You probably won't remember, but uh, you will like the two women that I acted for. Uh, kind of come to the next morning and know something awful has happened, and uh, you know, so so, it's, but but not know or might have a memory of getting in the cab, had a memory of, of accepting the drink, and then things went blank after that. Uh, and and um, the. The first woman that I acted for had been one of his earlier victims and she um, immediately, in fact, she woke up in hospital because what, what happened was um, he tried to drop her off at his, uh, at, at her address, but she had given him uh, uh, the wrong address and because uh, she kind of couldn't remember, she, anyway, it doesn't matter why, but she'd given her an address nearby to where she lived. So he always was you know, tried to get into the flat and the keys didn't work. And then somebody who lived there came down and saw, you know, she saw her in the cab, sort of slumped, unconscious, and 
and said, well, what, what's this? And he insisted on taking her, making more boys take her to the police station, uh, which, which she did. And then the police didn't make a note of this cab driver or anything. He, he drove off and she just woke up in hospital the next morning knowing something terrible had happened. And immediately, you know, kind of was aware that she'd been raped and reported it to the police. And the police, uh, you know, did just treated her a, a bit as a drunk and somebody who hadn't really remembered what had happened and didn't really do very much at all to investigate. And when they informed her that, uh, you know, they weren't going to take the case forward, she, uh, she was, I mean, it really, really shook her a lot. And she was, um, you know, she just said, well, uh, you know, he's going to do it again. She, she just, just kind of knew it. Uh, and sure enough, uh, he did for many years. And it was, it was six years later that she um, uh, heard on the news that this, this black taxi driver had been caught. And um, he, he um, in fact, the second woman who I acted for, um, she, she was four years later. And she, she Warboys was actually arrested after um, her attack because she walked back into her halls of residence. She was a student at French University, and and the, the security guy um, saw on on the um, uh, security that that this woman was being kind of carried almost by a taxi driver, and thought something was a bit odd. And they but they were able to catch his his uh, number plate. So he he was actually eventually arrested. Police interviewed him, but they just were not at all, you know, they just again thought that this was somebody who was, uh, you know, drunk and they were very convinced by this sort of, you know, very, very um, happy, chappy, gift of the gab type taxi driver to sort of almost embarrassed her, brought him into the police station and just let him go again. And he went on to attack, you know, another 30 women before eventually a police officer realised that she'd heard a similar story put two and two together and and then they, they then they realized they kind of linked it to the other time that they'd arrested mm -hmm. him and then they put an appeal out and just more and more and more women came forward uh, to report and my first client um was 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 asked then to go to an id parade um and she said one of the most distressing things for her of almost anything was actually seeing so many women who must have been raped after her, uh, all waiting to try and identify him. And, uh, you know, that, that's sort of something that kind of comes across quite strongly is from, from her and from, from others that I've worked with, um, you know, other rape victims, that this sort of sense of a duty to, to report somebody, you know, not just, just for their own, you know, because for their own sense of justice, because of, of a sense that, this man is, is dangerous. And I'm looking at David, who um, is a, uh, has been a client of mine for a number of years. Um, and uh, we, we can mention that case, but it, this will ring quite true to you and, and how things can go so horribly wrong. Um, but um, just to finish the, 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 the war boy's story. Um, so, so, so eventually um, he, was, he, was, he was apprehended and then he was tried. And convicted and sentenced and then we took the case um, using the, the Human Rights Act um, against the police, the Metropolitan Police and the police resisted the case because they didn't want to sort of break the, they didn't want to suddenly be held accountable for failures in their investigations and so they, 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 they sought to, to challenge our, our case every step along the way. I thought this is such a stark case that they'll just want to settle it at the first door, but they didn't. And, and actually, in a way, that was good because it ended up <laughs> it established a precedent, not only at the High Court, because then the police took it to the Court of Appeal, not only at the Court of Appeal, because then the police took it to the Supreme Court. And ultimately, um, you know, 10 years later nearly, uh, the Supreme Court establishes that the, there is this precedent about um, the, um, a duty to investigate uh, in sort of in any single case completely, but it does it does establish this 
this this general duty. And uh, um, so 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 whilst we were waiting for the Supreme Court judgment, the second bit of the War Boys uh, story arises, which is the um, uh, the um, decision of the parole board to release him from prison. And um, the, the, um, uh, when my clients and most of the rest of the population heard about this, they were saying, well, how, how can this be? You know, he, he attacks only women and he's only been in prison for eight years. And, you know, this, this can't be right. And um, we, we explored ways of, uh, you know, is there any way in which this decision can be challenged? Because although there's a, um, a, a precedent of being able to um, judicially review um, uh, uh, decisions of the parole board, if you are the prisoner, um, it's not, not so easy to do that, or it's, it, it's never really been done before that you can judicially review it from somebody from a different perspective. And so that, that, uh, that case, um, obviously received a huge amount of publicity and, and uh, we were, uh, we, when we brought the case, we thought we probably wouldn't get anywhere, but we, we had to see what, what was the basis for the decision. And actually when we did see the decision, we just thought, well, they've just gone completely bonkers really on why are they, you know, they haven't, they haven't really looked at it. Part of the problem was, there were a number of reasons why that, that was. Partly his sentence, was relatively short because CPS had only tried a small sample of the cases and uh, so um, it, 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 the, the judge only sentenced uh, the war boys to uh, 11 or 12 attacks which and, and mostly they were uh, for, for administering a noxious substance which is a lesser offence than rape um, and they've obviously gone for the kind of easy easy target. Um, and so when the parole board came to look at um, the decision about whether they're releasing it, they took the view that they could only um, consider his, his offending in relation to those matters on which he was convicted for. Um, and uh, and uh, the court, the, the high court in um, allowing our judicial review, which allowed him to, to be released, uh, was that um, uh, was was that actually if if there is you know very good evidence even if somebody hasn't been convicted of offences but of surrounding circumstances of offences they they ought to to look into that and take that into account so 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 that's established the other case uh, now all this was going on whilst I was in the process of setting up the Centre for Justice. So it was quite a. It was a. It was actually a kind of good opportunity, because because it, both those cases, in a sense, are fairly core to the kind of work that we do at Centre for Women's Justice, which is basically looking at at state failings uh, and uh, around the uh, uh, criminal justice system. And the War Boys case, in a sense, illustrates a whole a whole series of of different failings. So um, that's a sort of a kind of brief uh, a kind of overview of, of the War Boys case, which, which, which I'm happy to discuss in a bit more detail. Perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll mention um, uh, David's case, which is, which uh, he, he's, he's happy for me to do so, and as he's a member of the club, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, obviously happy to do so too. Uh, and David, um, uh, uh, approached me after, very tragically, um, his daughter, Eleanor, uh, had... Hi, come in. His daughter had taken her own life. Uh, Eleanor had um, reported a rape. Uh, by a man that she had been on a date with and um, he uh, probably for similar reasons uh, that, the, that the women in the Warbeck boys case reported it kind of wasn't sure couldn't couldn't remember very much about it but felt it was in you know was persuaded in fact by a 
the CSO, I think, the police community support officer, that you know that it was the right thing to do to report him. He was arrested. He happened to be um, a wealthy millionaire, uh, son of a uh, you know kind of very wealthy family. He was absolutely horrified that that he was accused of rape. Um, kind of went ballistic. The police investigated it, and actually, it was the police in this case were, you know, did you know have behaved properly? But but um, they 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 did. Uh, unfortunately, um, Eleanor had um, quite serious mental health problems, and um, and she was uh, quite inconsistent about a number of things. And the CPS, the, the police, just felt that. That it was a, it was going to be a very difficult case to bring to a prosecution. So they made a decision not to charge him. As soon as they made that decision, he then um, said, "Right, I'm going to get her prosecuted for converting the course of justice." Uh, and he asked the police to look into that. He said that she was lying and that she should be held accountable. Uh, and the police said, "No, we're not going to do that." You know. We've said, you know, that we're not going to prosecute you, but, uh, you know, we don't think, you know, we, the, 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 that's the right thing to happen. So they refused, and then he brought a private prosecution. And, um, you know, he, and basically the, the, the company, you know, a private company he paid for built up a lot of evidence, um, you know, went to all his friends and some of her friends and, you know, kind of got um, a lot of material, partly relating to, you know, some of her slightly odd behaviour from, from her mental illness, which sort of was undermining of her credibility and so, so on. And, um, you know, built up this case, which, um, with, which she was then summoned to appear in court. Um, her her defence uh, lawyers uh, said that this is a, an abusive process and, and and thought that the best way to stop this prosecution was to get the Crown Prosecution Service to take over the prosecution and stop it. And uh, so that's what um, uh, you know that you know that's what they were hoping would happen. Now uh, unfortunately um, this was back in 2013 wasn't it David? This was at a time when the CPS were beginning to get criticised quite a lot for taking some kind of high profile um, men on, who, who, some of whom were acquitted for rape, um, you know, some of the sort of big celebrity cases. And I think they were, they were quite nervous about, about this uh, case, um, but it, it, for whatever reason, uh, they made a decision to continue the prosecution, and I think at that that was the point at which uh, Eleanor uh, became deeply um, distraught, and um, very sadly, um, just just a few days before she was due to go to trial, took her own life. So um, David uh, wanted to actually hold CPS accountable, Crown Prosecution Service accountable for um, their decision to take over the prosecution. And I thought they should be held accountable. And we were exploring doing that through the inquest process. Yes. Um, so there was an inquest um, as there would always be into a death of someone who took their own life. And if you are able to argue that um, state failings are, in, are involved in um, in uh, uh, the circumstances surrounding the death, um, you, you can sometimes get a coroner to look at those those issues. Um, and and we we sought to argue, and I think we had quite a respectable argument that the CPS should be represented at the inquest and asked to maybe to answer questions about why they pursued this this prosecution. Um, that was strongly resisted by them, and the coroner decided not to. We tried to challenge that decision and, and, uh, and made the decision to go uh, public. Uh, and um, uh, we, we, we did some newspaper and media stories, but as soon as we did that, 
David was immediately being threatened by um, the, the, the guy who had brought private prosecution and, you know, told that he would expose his daughter for this, that and the other and that he would sue him for defamation. And I just thought this is outrageous, you know, mm -hmm. he's lost his daughter, how on earth, why on earth would you do that? And just, you know, we kind of tried to soldier on. Unfortunately, um, that's exactly what he did do. <laughs> and uh, as another case goes along, I didn't actually do the libel case, it was a bit beyond my, my um, area of knowledge, but um, this man, uh, who, whose name is, I think you can say is Economu, because it's become known as Economu v. De, De yeah. in in the High Court, sued, sued David, unfortunately lost. Uh, but, you know, what a thing to have to go through, a whole libel trial and an appeal, um, you know, for simply wanting to ask questions about the Crown Prosecution Service. Um, and I'm sure David will say more if, uh, or, or throw in more, but uh, uh, that is an illustration of, 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 an, you know, of one of many types of cases that we work with. Yeah. Uh, work around, um, but it, you know, it just absolutely tragic. And around the area of, of rape, you know, not only does rape occur, but it causes many, many women to take their own lives as well because of their, the failures of the justice system. And, and you know, uh, it's another issue. So, look, um, I, could, I, I could talk more about all sorts of other areas of work we do, but I think I've been going on for a, a half an hour or so, mm -hmm. um, and perhaps that's a, a bit of a focus for a discussion, yeah. I think. But do feel free if you want to ask me about any other areas of work that we do um, at the centre. Or, or that I've been involved in over the years uh, that you may or may not be aware of. Lovely. If we're open for questions, anybody want to look out on Zoom first event? Well, you might not be. Just one question on Zoom from Colleen. Do you want to take that? Okay, take sure. Colleen first and then get to you. Colleen, if you unmute yourself. Um, hi, everybody. Um, when I listened to the taxi driver story, especially, I wondered whether the failure of the police to take complaints of women seriously, um, is that a result of the gender imbalance in the police force? What is your hypothesis? <laughs> no, I don't think it's, a, it's specifically a result of the gender imbalance in the police force. I think that, that we live in a, a, a culture, a, 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 a culture which unfortunately uh, has misogyny running all the way through it and sexism running all the way through it. And there, there, that, that includes uh, within the police. Um, there are some very good police officers who do a, a good job and are determined to get justice, but that, that is an underlying um, theme. And uh, in, in relation to, to rape and sexual violence in particular, we, we also live in a very victim blame culture. And again, I think that infects all those working in the criminal justice um, system, from police officers through to crown prosecutors, through to uh, judges and um, you know parole boards and so on. It's it's there is a unfortunately um, a, 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 a very very strong culture that we see. You know, while you know the Sarah Everard case and the, the protests on the street and the kind of anger really uh, and what we're seeing in schools and everyone's invited and this whole you know it's it's a it's a huge it's a huge problem within policing i think there are some particular problems one of the other areas of work that we've done um a lot of work around is is abuse perpetrated by police officers um and we've done something called a super complaint which 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 looks at um the, the, the inbuilt problems within policing to um, tackle the issue of, of police officers who domestically abuse, who, who, who abuse their partners or who um, commit sexual misconduct in different ways. And um, that, you know, again, that's very, very, you know, that, that's received an awful lot of publicity uh, post the Sarah Averard case because of the, um, <laughs> the, the revelations about his 
his own previous offending mm -hmm. and also the culture within the police. You know, they, used, they called him the rapist, apparently, with some of his fellow officers. Um, you know, staggering things. Mm -hmm. So there is, there is within police culture, you know, that kind of locker room attitude amongst, amongst certain um, police officers. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, so that does also infect um, the way in which policing is done. I, I have to say that, that there's been some very good work done by some of the police leads um, and, and, and efforts to uh, shift the emphasis away from um, investigations into what, what happens with rape in particular. And I think the difficulty is rape uh, often you know, it, it, when you're, where where there is a dispute about consent, uh, you know, you have to, you know, one person's word against another, and you don't necessarily have any, you know, external evidence as to what happened. Um, so, um, you know, that that does feed into um, looking into the credibility of the complainant. And uh, at, at, but what's happened with rape is that policing has focused so much on almost investigating the victim rather than the suspect. And there are there, there is a recognition that, you know, amongst certain senior people within the police that, that has to that that has to shift. And you know, surprise, surprise, you should actually investigate the suspect. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but you know there are efforts to, to bring about change in that way. Yes. Um First of all, Harriet, I don't know if you remember me, but uh, when I was in private practice, you did instruct me. And that was one of the reasons why I wanted to come and, and forgive me for, for being late. Yeah. Um, two questions that I wanted to ask you. Um, about the economy case, I, I vaguely remember, I couldn't remember, I remember the facts, but it was when you said the name, I didn't know what the name was. But what that illustrates is if you've got a deep pocket rich client can game the system yeah. immediately. Um, what, if anything, do you think could be done to avoid that? Because if there's one place where people are supposed to be equal, it's in the eyes of the law. And that's not just with the protected characteristics under the Equalities Act. And even there, as you and I both know, they're very lacking in many ways. But certainly when it comes to um, money. So someone shouldn't be able to, just because they have a lot of money, to be able to buy someone's silence, which is what you wanted to do with that girl, and basically trash her name so much that she took her own life. So. Um, I wonder what your thoughts were about that. Um, on the second question, if I may, have you been involved in any of the um, rape cases or, or allegations of, of, of rape in the military system, so involving service personnel? And uh, I don't know if you work with the Centre of Military Justice. I, I used to work within defence. Um, so I'd just be interested in, on your views on that. Yeah. Uh, so, um... I'll answer the second question first. Um, Centre for Military Justice set up by Emma, Emma Norton. Norton, who is a, a, somebody I've worked with for many years. She's, she's brilliant and it's a great, great project, uh, which looks precisely at what you said around mm -hmm. issues of, of, of open sexual violence in the justice. So I have in the- She was here last week, actually, as, as my guest. Oh, yeah. right, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Anyway, she she's um, she's a great you know she, a great sort of sister and supporter of, of the centre and and uh, uh, but I haven't personally done done any of those cases myself but I'm 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 well aware of them particularly from talking to Emma about it. Um, and sorry, the first question is about defamation and, and about, about 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 powerful men using yeah using about the law. wealthy people. I mean, this one is a man, but I suppose it could be gender blind. But just basically, because if you've got more money, you shouldn't be able to buy the justice that you want. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know what views you have about that. Well, I, I, I completely agree that you shouldn't be able to, but that doesn't mean that you aren't able to. I mean, I think we certainly we have. Um, I mean, I, th I think. Um, the defamation laws are particularly um, vulnerable to, to that kind of exploitation and we, we've done, I mean defamation is a bit outside of our direct area but kind of uh, because it's not a sort of specifically a criminal justice issue but, but um, we, we're, we're, we're aware of many cases where wealthy men are silencing women from speaking out about abuse um, and there are cases going on at the moment where you know, or post me too, women have started sharing uh, stories 
about a particularly wealthy or powerful man, uh, say on Facebook or online, and suddenly are being faced with threats of legal action or actual legal action. And, uh, you know, that once you bring a defamation claim, the, the you know, the, the, um, the speaker has to prove the truth of, of you know, they, they, so the whole burden is reversed. It's a bit like in, also in, in David's uh, case, where the, the um, when, when somebody reports a rape, and if somebody's brought, brought you know, it's beyond, beyond reasonable doubt that you, you convict the, the person accused of, of rape. But if, if, if the rapist then brings a private prosecution for averting the course of justice, suddenly Eleanor or whoever is being prosecuted has to prove that she was raped. So the whole burden switches, and it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a really it's a something why, why I'm still entwined with David many years later in, in looking at ways to sort of raise some of the wider public interest points that that, that arose in in his case. But we we have, um, uh, you know, we we've been contacted, and we did we we we, we held a public meeting um, a couple of years ago. Uh, around around this issue, and uh, you know, it's kind of completely flooded with interest. It's a it is a really big uh, uh, area of interest. The other thing that comes up a lot, um, and all, although we don't do family law, we we often see um, men using the family law system, you know, coercing and controlling men to to control control women and 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 kind of putting them through the ringer. Through that, and if there's an you know unequal uh, access to money, as, as there often is, uh, you know, and many women are sort of virtually, you know, put put put, put or have to spend tens of thousands of pounds to fight for their kids against somebody who is able to manipulate the system. So yeah, it is it's it's a very good job, and no, uh, we don't have equality before the law because um, you know some people have. The ability to to um, obviously the law doesn't doesn't make a judgment, but it's very very hard to fight if you don't have the money. Yeah, I mean this this thing about inequality of arms is is not just in the theory of the law, because I've come across it myself, where I have a party in all the cases I hear who is a powerful public authority with unlimited means. If they want to go after somebody, they have the resources and that other person may not be able to fight it quite as equally, worse noise or whatever it is. And the example you've given about the police, you know, they have unlimited resources to defend a claim of the nature yeah. that you had. So there's an inequality of arms there. It's yeah. not just powerful men yeah. against women, but it's also public authorities yeah. who abuse their power Absolutely. and don't allow it to happen. So should there not be more scope for publicly funded yeah. um, actions against public authorities when they abuse their power or yeah. they abuse their power. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, we do have a legal aid system, uh, mm. but you have to be on uh, literally on benefits pretty much mm. in order to um, to bring a, a to, to have the benefit of legal aid if 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 it's an area of law where you're eligible in in the sort of uh, you know challenges against police, which is my <coughs> I guess my main area background, <clears throat> um, you know, if you know the, those are potentially fundable under uh, legal aid, but of course, you know, <laughs> you, you don't have to be um, on on benefits or very wealthy to be a victim of rape, and most mm -hmm. most people are somewhere in between. And uh, so, so what what are the options? Well, in fact, when we brought the 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 uh, war boys. Challenge. Um, we uh, neither of those women. I mean, neither of them were rich at all. But neither of them were eligible for legal aid. They both, you know, at, were working. Um, so um, at that time, uh, we brought it under a conditional fee agreement, mm -hmm. which you can still do. But at that time, <laughs> this is this is probably a really complicated costs point, which you'll probably be mm -hmm. familiar with. But uh, uh, you know, maybe the others that aren't involved in. The law aren't, but you, if you bring a case, that costs you, you, you become liable for costs of the other side if you lose. And so, uh, taking a, a case on a conditional fee, uh, 
doesn't necessarily protect you from, from actually having to pay the cost of the other side. At that time, this was before 2013, um, the women were able to get something called after the event insurance. Mm. So they were able to, to move forward confidently um, with the conditional fee agreement. Unfortunately, uh, that, that is no longer available currently uh, for, for Human Rights Act claims and for a whole range of other claims. It is for certain claims. There is a, another way of, of, of kind of insuring people, but, but uh, so, so it's much, much harder, um, much more risky. Anyone ask a question? Can I ask a question? Yes, please, Andrew, yes. Uh, um, way you I'm, a, I'm a former probation officer. Uh, I retired in 1997, but during my period of time, I was aware of the judiciary sentencing for um, uh, uh, offences like flashing, which in my experience often led to much more serious events, uh, offences later on in that person's offending behaviour. Um, were, was treated very trivially in the early years. Um, I'm wondering now, my concern is, how well are the police forces trained to understand the nature of how sexual offences are um, um, progressed, which can lead to rape? That's a really good question, really good question, and, and actually a very, very... Um, Personal, again, looking at a Sarah Everard case, um, because um, you know the, those, uh, you know, he was he was um, you know reported for two or three um, indecent, uh, essentially flashing type uh, uh, offences, uh, which weren't weren't uh, uh, treated in the way that they should have been as an indicator of of you know wider offending or progressing on to, to worse. Worse offending, um, uh, and they are a good indicator. And no, I don't think there is enough understanding or training or commitment uh, around around those those lesser offences. Yes, I I found it. I used to get the police records of of uh, sentencing, um, and would try and draw attention, if not uh, to, uh, to through my seniors to the magistrates to draw attention to the senior police officers that they should really start to look, um, be aware of the of what how this person's behavior could progress. I just wondered if it is now a part of the education system. It should be. <laughs> it should be. I don't think it is. Uh, I mean, um, we were just, um, we were discussing, uh, I mean, the, 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 the um, issue in relation to domestic abuse just today and a, but one of the things we, we run is something called a femicide working group, where we look at issues about police preventing, uh, you know, the police failures to, to uh, prevent a uh, domestic abuse relationship escalating into um, uh, murder. And uh, what, what one, of, one of the issues that we were just discussing is that the police have something called a dash risk assessment, which, which has various various things that you tick box when so if you if you arrest um, a, a man for um, or a, you know a person accused for a domestic abuse incident you you will try and find out what other things he's done and then kind of determine what risk he is but the problem is it's it's very much focused on on physical violence and not other forms of coercive control and behaviour. And, and, and therefore, you may be actually missing um, the dangerousness of, of, of an individual. Uh, and, and, and so many cases uh, where, where, where we as lawyers are looking at, uh, you know, at the very tragic end of, uh, you know, when somebody is murdered and uh, you're saying, well, why didn't, why this could have been prevented had, had, he, had his, you know, lesser offending being tackled uh, much more robustly. Or at all, uh, at, you know, previously. So, so I, I mean, I do think um, there is uh, a really, really, really huge justice gap and lack of understanding around this assessment uh, and, and, and uh, appreciation of who who actually does does present a risk and who who doesn't. 
Uh, interestingly, we 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 uh, one of my other big areas of work is 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 also around um, bringing criminal appeals on behalf of, of women who have killed uh, abusers. And uh, um, you you probably will be familiar with the Sandy Challenge case, which is which is one that I that I worked on. And um, what what we what I do find is that that those women are judged by by the same stat. You know, there, there is no there, there is no appreciation of the underlying sort of power dynamic within within those relationships. And so victims of abuse who basically um, end up committing an offence to survive um, are are punished very severely and subject to the same uh, or risk risk assessments within the prison system. And as somebody who, who who has been a historic perpetrator and uh, you know has committed, uh, you know who, who, who may be a much more serious risk. West or Hingley, for instance. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> do you do any? Oh, sorry. Oh, please. Um, any any project joint project with GMA with London Mayor, like risk assessment or any work with your charity? On what? Sorry. On in general, like this risk assessment or enlightenment, just general. Well, we're 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 focused on uh, on as a legal charity, and mm -hmm. so we're looking at um, uh, basically at, at bringing cases or helping women get access to justice around mm -hmm. cases. So the issue of, of of risk assessment may come in within uh, some of the cases or uh, issues that we do work around, but it's not it. We don't do sort of separate work. Um, just to return to your, your previous point, uh, I, I do quite a lot of assessments of uh, people who are in prison, often in determinate sentences, uh, when they're uh, applying for parole. Yeah. And I've sort of historically worked a lot with women who've been through the criminal justice system. I think one, one of the additional challenges is that there's very little appreciation for the tremendous vulnerability of these women and the enormous early developmental traumas, yeah. um, vulnerability to predatory characters, you know, the poly drug use that can affect all sorts of aspects of cognition and mm -hmm. ability to kind of navigate your way out of mm -hmm. threatening situations. Uh, and the fact that often when these women are potentially to be released from prison, there's a real absence of any intervention for that polydrug use, for trauma work to enable them to develop coping strategies, for any kind of uh, informed, a fully informed risk management plan, which gives them the structure and support they need to be able to keep themselves safe, avoid returning to substance use, often there's a real lack of coping strategies outside polydrug use. Uh, and actually, often they're set up really to end up in situations where they'll be vulnerable once again, and the cycle repeats. Mm -hmm. And so there are so many systemic failings. Mm -hmm. And actually, if these young women had, when they'd first become known to the justice system, been offered the treatment they required, the story twenty years later would have been very, very different. Yeah. Yeah. What's your what's your area? Are you uh, psychology? I'm, so, I'm a psychologist. I'm, I'm a clinical neuropsychologist. Oh, uh, nice. uh, my first jobs were all in forensic settings. Yeah. So before I trained clinically, I trained in forensics. I worked uh, in medium security units and in Brixton and Wandsworth prisons. Uh, but now I do a lot of assessments around neuropsychological function for people oh. up for parole yeah. that have had multiple brain injuries. Which then impacts. There's a very interesting areas. report, actually. Um, I think from Scotland, Scottish prisons, that uh, the, 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 some extraordinarily high number of women in prison had brain injuries, mainly from two thirds. Medicine. Two thirds of prisoners. Is, is that the, is that in England as well? Is that, that was in, yes, it's incredibly high because yeah. there's often such domestic violence. Yes. Uh, you know, so if you've been hit in the head by yeah. a violent violent parents yeah. and your child, yeah. you won't develop the sort of psychological or cognitive hardware yeah. to be able to cope with life. Yeah. If you then cope with that by drinking when you're sort of 12, 13 to yeah. sort of self-medicate, yeah. you further 
alter the brain development. Yeah. You haven't got the sort of psychological software. If you haven't had nurturing environment. Yes. And then your path is sort of set. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I, 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 I think uh, <laughs> you know another big project that we're doing is 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 basically looking at um, the unjust criminalisation of women who are victims of domestic abuse. And and, and 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 you know probably you know work alongside uh, a number of organisations around women prisoners, um, but but looking at um, you know the, the the numbers of women in prison who who are victims of domestic abuse and sexual abuse of kids and and violence and you know the, the high level of trauma that that uh, you know many of those women in prison are dealing with, and it's just you know like why are we why are we locking all these these women up who being bit to mask, you know, the sort of way in which we solve these problems is, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge problem and, uh, you know, it's, it's very important work that you're doing to, to sort of highlight those issues, I think. I don't know if there's, that's, if, if you have a specific question. Well, no, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I, I stopped working in prisons some years ago, really, but now I go back into them and I think, and, you know, I was actually in one the other day in, in Grantham, and I was in their sort of program suite, which is where the psychological interventions are delivered. And I was looking at the, the, the program, you know, their programs called things like enhanced thinking skills or you know, yeah. managing my anger. I thought, but you're working with people who have 25 year histories of violence and aggression. Mm -hmm. And actually, managing anger, that's not the least of the problems. We're talking about people who've got massive, complex trauma. Yeah. Uh, Male and female, there are plenty of very traumatized men in the prison system as well, of yeah. course. But actually, there is nothing like the knowledge or expertise or resource, or maybe the will within the justice system to tackle the underlying psychosocial problems. Yeah. Well, there's some, some obvious political uh, context to that, aren't there? Isn't there? <laughs> Indeed. Uh, one is that, you know, sort of uh, criminal justice solutions are sometimes much easier uh, you know for politicians to to um, you know kind of just you know mm -hmm. be sentencing mm -hmm. again and again and again and things like that without without reference. Uh, and, and and secondly uh, resourcing. Um, so I, I, I you know I think I think that that obviously is part of the problem but it, it, it's it, it's you you know if you if you sort of do you know, kind of the a kind of economic cost benefit analysis of it. Actually, if we were able to just intervene uh, effectively uh, early on and, and stop stop this these things developing, we wouldn't have so many, so much crime and so much so many people having, having to pay to be locked up and in prisons. But you know, that's the sort of bigger question, isn't it? Okay. Any, any more questions? Just. One observation. Okay. Um, there's been there was an interesting article in the Daily Telegraph, sorry, today um, about the Met Police, which basically argues it's not necessary to blame the commissioner. Um, basically, because I think because she's a woman, and yeah. it's an easy way of criticising. Yeah. But the whole Metropolitan Police needs taking apart root branch simply because it has two functions, national and metropolitan. And it says, and I'll use quite nicely, that it would be a very good idea if they split the responsibilities because at the present time, no one seems to be accountable. If it's on national, it's the Home Secretary. If it's on metropolitan, it's the mayor. Mm -hmm. And each slip out from underneath yeah. when it comes yeah. to responsibility. Yeah. It, do you agree with that assessment? And that it really means pulling apart and the two functions divided. Um, I think so, yeah. I mean, it's not something I've sort of that particular issue that I've um, particularly engaged with, but I, I think, you know, with, with all these different um, criminal justice agencies, policing in particular, and the CPS, I, I mean, I, we are in battle a lot with the Crown Prosecution Service. Um, issues of accountability and of, of, of how how you make because I, I, I suppose the key the key issue that we deal with at the Central Women's Justice is not the lack of laws, 
but it's the lack of implementation, effective implementation or any implementation of the laws and policies that we have. Uh, that that's the problem. So we you know, saw a constant thing about oh we need another law to address this or that. And yes, there are you know laws obviously <laughs> serve a serve an important purpose. And sometimes creating a new law, we were involved in um, promoting and successfully achieving a a, a new standalone offence for non-fatal strangulation recently as part of an amendment to the domestic abuse. Act. And that's important, you know, because it, it sends message to policing about what to look out for as a serious indicator of risk. And, and, and um, you know, it's important to have a law like that. But uh, laws uh, are, are themselves are, are of, of limited value unless unless there's a kind of uh, a kind of commitment to enforcing them. <laughs> Well, at some stage, I'd just like to say a few words about Harriet, if I may. Okay. Is that all right to do? Yes, that? absolutely. I promise yes. I won't be too, too, too no. long, but I would like to say yes, something. Yes. Um, I have had the extreme good fortune to know Harriet for the past six years, and latterly being involved in the Centre for Women's Justice. And the whole thing behind the Centre for Women's Justice and the way that Harriet um, operates has enabled me to have a voice. Um, there are many things that the Centre for Women's Justice do, but I think the most, one of the most important aspects for me was the ability to have a voice. And I've noticed that not just in respect of myself, but also I've seen how David Shannon, um, son of, of, of Sally, uh, how he has grown. Uh, in his case, um, the Centre for Women's Justice didn't just give him a voice, they actually gave him and us um, a vocabulary. I mean, the whole concept of coercive control mm -hmm. is something that has really only come to the fore because of the awareness that we've been able to uh, achieve of that through the Center of Work for Women's Justice. So it is um, the ability to have this voice which Okay, in a sense, it cost me and I got sued for libel, but, um, you know, uh, I, I do welcome the fact that I actually had that voice and that that was given to me by the Centre for Women's Justice. Because on the other side of the coin, um, those with wealth, um, they, their wealth gives them their voice. Um, <laughs> and not only does their wealth give them their voice, but their wealth can also give them their wealth back. Um, uh, uh, they're able to claim um, from of all places the legal aid board um, uh, the costs they've been incurring in their private prosecutions. Uh, I, I won't go on that because uh, uh, that's not that's not seeing the praises of Harriet, and um, that's really what I want to do. So anything and everything that you can do to help fund the Centre for Women's Justice, please, please, please do whatever you can, because they are giving people who need a voice, a voice. So please help them to do that. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Help me to this. No more contributions, questions, reflections. I'll hand over to Tim. Go on. Yes, well, this has been a very stimulating discussion. I'm glad that everybody around the table, always if you get a smaller group, you often get more value out of it, and that's been proved to be the case this evening. So we're extremely grateful that Harriet's given up her time to come and talk to us and, and, and stimulate our discussion. I'm always full of admiration for those who say that the prime purpose of the law is to stop abuse of power by whomever it is exercised. Whether it's been a coercive man, an overbearing um, public authority or a or anybody else who either abuses their power or doesn't use it in the way that they're supposed to and so it's a great public service that you perform um, through both personally in your long period of legal practice and lastly with the um, the charity that David has very eloquently described the merits of so we're extremely grateful that you came and thank you very much indeed thank you very much